It's wonderful to see so many of you here in person for the Friday Career Talk today. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Alex Johnston. I'm the Director of Master's Programs and Career Management here in the Department of Linguistics. And it's my pleasure to host a series of career talks throughout the year that bring in people, linguists, linguists, I should say, who have training in our areas, our subfields, and who have careers that take place outside of higher education in business, tech, non nonprofit, and government. And today we have one of my favorite people here from all the way from Boston. Alfonso Sanchez Moya. And I had I had this introduction prepared, but I'm gonna throw it out because I already linked to his impressive academic CV. This person has a list of honors, awards, grants, funding, and degrees <laughs> that is so long. And in fact, for the reception today, which I invite you all to stay for, I selected some cheeses from the countries where you received <laughs> your degrees. <laughs> and we must identify them by flavor and country. Like I'll do my best. <laughs> remember, remember your time in the country getting those degrees. So many. And uh, what's so interesting is that for this person who has such a passion and love for teaching and research, and who has accumulated this stellar early career academic CV, he has exemplified some of the mindset that I really hope that you see modeled before you today. The mindset of being curious, of taking risks, of learning new skills, of being a lifelong learner, and, and just taking that improvisational yes and approach to a career pathway. So it was just two years ago in the summer of 2021 that I met Alfonso over Zoom when he attended the linguistics career launch that was a, an endeavor, a boot camp produced by the linguists beyond academia of the LSA. It was a 19 day boot camp scheduled out nine to five with training and with panels of linguists to show and tell how they develop their careers beyond academia. And this is a person who stood out in a Zoom audience for this virtual bootcamp as someone who was so engaged and lively and curious. And so he quickly became someone who uh, really made a lot of use of the workshops and networking opportunities and panels that we that we put on. And so this is actually the first time we've met in person. And it's been wonderful. I'm so glad we were able to come. Yeah. I will let him introduce more of his background, but I just want you to, to take note of this, um, this wonderful mindset of, of creativity, creativity and openness to new possibilities. And I want to give you a very, very warm welcome to the Department of Linguistics here at Georgetown. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. So, well, first of all, thank you very much for making it today. It's a Friday afternoon. I know it's a longer holiday ahead of us. So I really thank you for making the time just to be here with us. I, I really hope I can, you know, I can meet the expectations that just try to provide some of my um, personal experience, actually. That's going to try. I'm, I'm just going to try to do that, right? Just provide my own path, see how it can be somehow referential um if if that serves i i don't like to position myself as someone who you know like to be looked at to it's just people's life you know like we do have different paths and all of them are very <laughs> valid so that's what i try to do so first of all thank you for finding the time to be in here second and very important for me thank you alex dr johnston for making it like this beautiful invitation to Georgetown. I always tell people Washington was kind of the few places in the US I was always very attracted to, you know, like, oh, I really want to go see Georgetown, see what's out there. So it's it's really nice to be here in person, just to be here in the Department of Linguistics. Very inspirational. Like we had this chat before. Um, I studied uh, several MAs, but one of them was in discourse studies. And, you know, while doing that, we actually get a lot of influence from people um, doing research at Georgetown. So congratulations to you all as well, just to be here. I think it's just a privileged world. Um, 
Now, we're going to get started. Thank you, people on Zoom. I'm just going to try not to move very much. I move a lot, so I apologize in advance. It's like I'm moving like around the room and just the microphone is not getting my voice. But I'll, I'll do my best just not to try to um, at least move too much. Right. So um, also, very important disclaimer, Alex mentioned I'm currently employed by Amazon. Um, most of the things that you'll be seeing here are just coming from my own personal experience. So that is something that I always like to use as a disclaimer. It's not that I'm putting here myself as a representative of Amazon or someone who necessarily, you know, embodies, you know, many of the values and, and many of the things that, um, you know, actually characterize that company. So that said, I'm just gonna get and give you um, a very quick introduction. I'm gonna be timing myself. I'm, I'm kind of aware of time. Just see if you're okay with this. I'm gonna try to provide a general background. So um, I'm just gonna see, okay. So plan and objectives, things that I'm planning to do today, things that I would like to share with you. Um, then different sections, it's going to be mostly three blocks. So first of all, a little bit of, about my background. Most of you in this room, if not all of you in this room, have a connection to linguistics, um, different fields within linguistics. That's, that's something I'm aware of. But um, my personal background and how I actually got trained as the linguist, discourse analyst, is something that to me is also very important just to share with you. I'll try not to use more than 10, 15 minutes for this block. Um, I'll just keep an eye on the timer, especially because I think, you know, this is a career talk. So the interesting part will be how did I transition from this research background into something more industry related? So that's going to be the second block. So like, like transferable skills, the industry prep the interview prep, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's gonna be 20 minutes, hopefully. This is ideal scenario. Let's see how I make it for that. Um, and then the final uh, block, it's gonna be like retrospective, like, okay, 18 months after this change, what is happening? How do I see my experience at Amazon so far? I'm gonna be sharing with you the many challenges that I found when I started. Um, like this idea of like CDA person in industry, I'm not sure how many in this room are actually related or aware of critical discourse analysis, but it has a very interesting agenda of not very corporate. Let's 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 leave it there, right? So it's funny because you know, it, in some ways, I somehow question that a lot myself. Like, oh, I did just a huge career with. CDA and um, this context is kind of completely the opposite, but I'm just going to try to explain how do I see my role and my expertise fit in there. And then, well, finally, final thoughts, Q&A. Um, I know that we do have the reception, so I'm very happy to take the reception to the wines and cheeses. I'm very, um, I'm very much hoping there's some Manchego cheese because it's the region Atlantic <laughs> conference. If not, that's fine. <laughs> Name Trader Joe. It's just Mexico. Right? <laughs> very, very fine. <laughs> um, uh, if not, just make sure you get some Manchego cheese at some point. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Right, so I'm going to start timing this section, 10, 15 minutes, and I know it's going to be a lot of information, but I don't really want to overwhelm you with my research experience. I, again, like this is not the main purpose of this book. Well, I come from this very generic understanding of, of seeing discourse as social practice, and by that, of course, we mean things like this. So it's just seeing how language and action correlate. This idea of language and society being so intertwined and so connected that in a way you cannot think of one without thinking of the other. Um, we also see discourse that this idea of like agent social construction, so discourse having a key role to actually shape and mold many of the societal practices that we are embedded in. And as you very well know, I'm sure, it's not that we do have an interest in one specific linguistic unit per se, but just, you know, like the phenomena, social phenomena, and how language discourse plays a role there. So, of course, there is also this idea of identity. And I'm sure, again, many of you in this room 
you have a sensitivity towards the idea of the fluidity of identity. So how, um, you know, it's, it's a process embedded in social practices. And it actually, a huge deal of that takes place in interactional occasions. Um, it's interesting because we don't, or I do not necessarily see identities as something very individual or definitely not like it's a monolithic kind of construction, but rather it's this idea of like a negotiation, a, a process of negotiating different identities and how that happens mostly in social settings. Um, and, and of course, and, and that's why we see this connection between, between a discourse and identity and social phenomena, um, this connection and this idea of identities um, entailing discursive work. So this, this powerful thought of identities are conveyed, built, performed in discourse, and definitely through linguistic and non-linguistic means. Okay, so of course, now, how do we get into critical discourse analysis? The role of power is definitely essential here. So how do we connect discourse, identity, and power, CDA is the perfect place for that. So um, these theoretical influences that uh, many people within CDA have, right? So this idea of power is constitutive of um, society, and also this powerful thought of power not coming from language only, but having this retro kind of effect between both of them. Um, if we think of critical discourse analysis, something that comes to my mind and to um, people's minds in many cases is this idea of exploring social inequalities, exploring how identities are actually shaped by, um, you know, uh, these ideas of dominant ideologies. Um, so that is also why I was very interested in putting these three things together, and that's something that really shaped my career since very early stages. I've got to tell you that my BA was in English in Spain. We do have an interesting mixture of things. So we do um, linguistics and also literature of, you know, the United Kingdom, of the US and a lot of culture. In, I'm 35 at the moment. So back in the time um, we studied Philologia Inglesa, English philology, which is a beautiful word, but really tells you it's a very kind of like classic understanding of, you know, uh, you know, understanding of language, right? So we did like Greek, Latin, we also did, you know, you know the basics, morphology, the history of language. So it was a very interesting thing. However, though, it was, I was very drawn to something more in between. So for me, always linguistics, uh, the way that I got access to linguistics, early age stages, was like this formal understanding of linguistics that it's very nice and beautiful, but definitely not that aligned with my own interests. So that's why I had this curiosity to know how language discourse identities can be combined and studied and actually better understood. So I'm just gonna present two main projects that I actually, the very telling and kind of shaped my own personality as a person, but also as a uh, researcher. So this is something I started out, um, so I finished my undergrad, I went into something very, very um, practical, which was like, okay, um, I was sharing that with Angeles, for example, or with some other people here that I, I'm the first person in my family actually getting a university degree. So I'm always, and I was always very aware of the fact that I could actually you know, I needed to get a job as soon as I finished my undergrad. So to me, what I did was like, okay, let's play it safe. Let's just get an MA in teaching English, which is something that I was always, you know, passionate about. So after that, I was like, okay, I really want to get into something more specialized. I, I could actually see how I was connected. I'm really interested in language, discourse, society, identity, power. And that's how I ended up at the University of Lancaster. Um, United Kingdom, beautiful place, a bit, you know, tiny and small for my own um, taste, but it was a fantastic department and that's where I started up this project. So what I did here, um, and, and again, this is not something that I really want to pay a lot of attention to. This is just to show the clear social motivation of the topic that I was interested in, intimate partner violence, 
pervasive our society is a lot of misconceptions many people tend to think that domestic abuse i don't like that term but it's usually you know like known as that intimate partner violence is actually pervasive regardless of the society regardless of the class you're in it's different manifestations but it's always you know like it's it is that um i was mostly interested in this situation and especially how women went through those and they're very interested in counter discourses um also back at the time but also now of this very instant question like oh but what happens to abuse against men and well while it's not denied by literature figures are really clear in that regard it's disproportionately affecting women if we compare it to men it's actually more women the ones who are killed by partners or ex-partners so to me it was a clear uh, motivation to actually get to see what was going on there and i was um in a way i, I wanted to know okay but what happens if um how do these women construct themselves discursively depending on the stage within the abusive relationship they're in so if it's an initial stage of abuse or a final stage of abuse, do I change the way I conceive myself? I see myself. I talk about myself in specific terms. So am I a mother? Am I a victim? Am I a wife? Am I different social actors that could be seen there? So this is the main thing I wanted to explore, but I also wanted to see what happens to, okay, male perpetrators. How are they defined? And for that, I did all this um you know interesting research that was part of my one of my MAs and also the PhD dissertation in which I, I looked at discourse online in public fora um back at the time as well ethics around digital data was becoming more of an aware thing like it was it was people were more aware of that it had to I spent a lot of time making sure my research was compliant with ethical good practice and in a way um, just to give you some ideas of things um, that I um, came up with. Um, so from this initial abuse, initial stage, where women in this online forum were talking about, okay, is it abuse? Am I being abused? Um, we could see more of a prevalence on individuals. So I am this person. I am um, a, a victim or not. So it was a more focus on the individual. I also pay attention to something that is fascinating to me, which is this social cognitive and seeing how metaphors play a role. So it was really interesting to see how weather metaphors were really pervasive in that first category. If you think of, you know, storms, if you think of snow, if you think of heavy rain, there's actually nothing you can do to actually battle that. It's just stay there and, and, and wait until that happens. That changed in the final um, community in life after abuse, and it was a more collectivized tendency. So we're moving from a or, or you know victim, woman, etc., to something like more essential. Like okay, I'm a lady, I'm I'm, I'm a woman, I'm not a victim, or I'm not like a, a wife, for example. And we could also see a lot of war metaphors, which in a way was very interesting to see how this process. For many of the participants in the study was actually a very empowering process. Again, this is just to give you a taste of projects that shaped my personality as a researcher. Once that was finished, I came to the US and this is something that I started off at the Department of Government at Harvard. Harvard is not necessarily, you know, linguistics, it's very, very heavily influenced by formalist understandings of language. So things like, oh, um, intimate partner violence and discourse, or migration and discourse, it's not something that really fits. So um, that's that's how I ended up in the Department of Government, you know, with a professor who is very interested in seeing like, okay, which are the connections between language and society? So. Again, I'm not going to go through this. Um, we all know, I think we're very aware of, of, of how pervasive migration is in the US. And we do have some tricky experiences when it comes to how um, undocumented immigrants, especially, which was the focus of my research, are actually constructively discur um, um, discursively constructed. Tiny, subtle things. So um, Clinton wants to flood 
our country, danger is massive, no. So things like that were things that I was interested in, especially when it comes to metaphors and, and, and you know, the use of metaphors to construct um, undocumented immigrants. So this is what I wanted to see. And also I wanted to see which of the variables could actually make an impact on how people construct, conceive undocumented immigrants. So social class, party affiliation, which was one of my original hypotheses. Let's see what came out. But yeah, that was the type of um, uh, project I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So this came from, um, that was a, actually, that was the most beautiful contribution to Harvard. My professor was very reluctant at first to include an open-ended question in the question there. It was like, oh, well, you know, I don't think people, I mean, fantastic professor coming from this field of social wisdom, not social wisdom, uh, theology, politics, like, oh, agreeing to disagree, one to five, click, 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 and finished. He was very reluctant at first just to include an open-ended where people had to write things there. I really had to push for that because that was the main interest that I had. So um, that was, fortunately, we ended up gathering like 1,200 responses, which is like a very sound sample. And the two things, this was part of a bigger um, survey, the two things that were related to my own project were these things. So first of all, um, participants had like undocumented immigrants are blank, so people could actually write whatever they wanted. And after that, they were prompted with this kind of metaphorical domains. So undocumented immigrants are flooding into, eroding, attacking, invading, infesting, which is, you know, like very problematic metaphorical domains. And in a way, those of you not familiar with metaphor, um, to me, it's so interesting if you just, this, this very fast Google test, if you just go click Lot into you got interesting you get interesting mental schemas that you very fast get there so of course a lot of water you can see a lot of people not really knowing what to do like it's okay this is the water that we're having what can we do to avoid it whereas if you go and say attack you get all this white variety a very interesting plethora of images about you know what implies to be attacked so, surprise, surprise, um, we got some correlations and that was very interesting because party affiliation was not statistically significant. I was actually going for the most basic understanding of this. Well, if you're a Democrat, maybe you just don't go for investing the US or attacking the US, right? Maybe you show some sensitivity towards that. That variant, that, that variable was not statistically significant. We did get some um, interesting options. So, for example, things like attack the US resonated more with men who were younger, wealthier, less educated. Flooding into, so like a metaphor rooted in a natural domain, resonated more with women older, less wealthy, more educated parts of this sample. Okay. The thing is that. As I was saying before, a lot of interesting things really happened in the open-ended question. So a lot of interesting metaphorical domains that I had not considered. So things like a drain on the American society or something that is terrifying to me. And when I talk about these things, I don't want to be perceived as someone who's just like very away from this. It's, it's like they should be returned to their countries. It's like if you think of the metaphorical mapping of that, it's a very, very disturbing one. Um, you also got interesting syntactic, like pragmatic constructions. So, okay, undocumented immigrants are fine as long as if provided that. So it was interesting to see the disclaimer that many of these people actually used that to say, you know, to, to actually talk about human beings. Right. I made it. <laughs> 15 minutes. That's all I wanted to do for my research background, but I really wanted to give you a general understanding of where, you know, the areas that I come from. This is not a necessarily formal syntax. This is not morphology. This is not phonology. This is what I used to do when I was actually in my academic career. Now, what happened?
happens. <laughs> and this is the fun part. Now we get started with the fun part. I came to the US September 2019. Fun, great. Oh, amazing. It was a great opportunity. I was I was sharing that with some of you before. Um, like no family issues, like I could actually, my parents are very young, no uh, partner, no kids, no mortgage, no nothing. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's just go to America. Let's see what I can do there. So, so I came September 2019. And I think we all know what's coming, right? <laughs> <laughs> I went back to Spain for Christmas. La la la, this is nice and great. I came back to the US and then I never left. <laughs> literally. <laughs> a lot literally, that's not right. Um, so yeah, a lot of things happened. Like, of course, the most important thing, a global pandemic. I'm sure we all went through some kind of repercussions to that. Um, interestingly, as I said before, I came to the US without any kind of uh, uh, personal commitments. Like a bit before the pandemic started, I started to get into a personal commitment. I was like, oh, this is not timely. <laughs> this is definitely not a nice thing for now. But that's how it happened. So I stayed in the US to a point that I needed to see what to do. Remember, I came for a postdoc. I'm sure you are aware of this, but if not, I can just share my experience with this. When you're a postdoc, you're not guided perhaps in the same way as you are guided when you're a PhD. So it's many years of a relationship with an advisor. It's it's a different type of relationship. In the US, actually, doctoral programs tend to be six years. In Europe, it's just three, four. Actually, they push you to do it in three. It's like, okay, okay, you have to do it. So interestingly, as a postdoc, it's not that I had had the time to really create academic connections with people at Harvard. My advisor was a wonderful person, but understandably, he had different priorities when COVID started, right? We all had. So I get at this point of like, okay, reference less in a country where I was not really familiar with. Academically, as Alex mentioned before, my background is strongly embedded in Europe, in Spain mostly, but also in the Netherlands, in the UK. So I ended up here as like, okay, what do I do now? So, this is the second part of the talk. Uh, jump to industry, transferable skills, industry prep, and interview prep. What happened? Summer 2021, I can see kind of like, okay, things are just coming, kind of getting better. And something that after three, well, and BA, three MAs, and a double PhD, I, even, I feel really ashamed of saying this now, actually. This is scary. <laughs> also, mind you, the, the, the tendency in Europe is we don't actually pay a lot to get educational degrees. Uh, people support you. Like, you don't need to return the money to actually um, get educated, which to me makes a lot of sense, personally. <laughs> um, but after all that... And actually, I actually thought that as a you know, after a postdoc at Harvard, my my ego was gonna be okay, now I got all the skills that I needed. Not true. I reached July 2021 and I person and I'm not lying at all, it is honest. Me asking people around me, okay, but what are the skills that I have? I, I don't really know which are my skills. It's it was kind of like, okay, what how what can I do? Like with all this education, like, and now what? So, well, this is something I discovered, and this is also something to you, just in case some of you may be getting this question at some point in your careers. Now, what to do? So we get to this great moment <laughs> of July 2021, and very accidentally, like many things in life. I bumped into this tweet about, oh, this um, bootcamp, um, LCL kind of thing to linguistics outside academia. And as you can imagine, uh, my personal being at that time really resonated with me. It's like, oh, also, it was a time, 2021, where 
we were getting a lot of, you know, tech was really, really getting people from different backgrounds to see how we could actually contribute to, um, you know, these type of technologies, voice assistants, et cetera, et cetera. So I bumped into this um, tweet that I couldn't retweet, by the way. I was actually trying to get the initial message, but I couldn't. But this is just the confirmation for the tickets that I got. So that was a 19th day kind of boot camp. Great, I'm so excited, full-time, nine to five thing. And the wonderful people that you actually need to help you shape your skills, your career understanding, what, how you kind of see yourself as a professional, as a human being. Of course, you have like leading Alex Johnston, amazing, you very honestly, and I'm, I'm not saying this because Alex is here, but you're very lucky, extremely lucky to have someone like Alex next to you. And I'm really hoping, yes, let's let's just give her a very long time. This is genuine, Alex. It was, you know, when, when you do something because you feel you can change people's lives, that's not something we always get in the educational settings. It's something that in most cases, I mean, we see it, but more in the long term, right? Like student reaching to you, reaching out, oh, well, this, this. But to me, it was a very, very clear example of how bumping into someone can actually make a huge impact on someone's life. So I found this <laughs> and alongside fantastic professionals that really created a beautiful program in which we actually learned a lot about many of these things. It is true, I'm checking it is true that um, the, you can actually get to know a lot of um, information about linguistics career launch at the moment. I'll give you some ways to start back. But I, um, this is the fun part because I decided to bring a lot of the materials that I used during this process. So this is what I did actually. As you can see, you can move around if you want, but during all that time, it was taking intensive notes of everything that I heard of this, wow, there is someone at this company that has a PhD in linguistics. Well, let's let's find out. Like, what was this? Like interviews, like etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Because I'm sure the, the notebook is going to be lingering. This is just an example. So honestly, things like industry names, people that or things that I personally hadn't heard before. UX experience. What is that? Like honestly, I, I just didn't. <laughs> Human, you know, it's a good <laughs> <laughs> Of course, this is like in a moment of people talking on me, old fashioned being as I am, like writing things down, like seeing how you know I could make sense of everything. Something very interesting that I was definitely not aware of, but okay, which are the names for the roles that we can actually take as linguists? Um, I'll talk about this later on, but. My LinkedIn profile, apart from having like, I don't know, 40 connections, because, you know, when you're in academia, you don't really care about LinkedIn. It's like, OK, you care about research, care, you care about school, like Google Scholar, you care about many other things, but not LinkedIn necessarily. So I, I, I actually saw that my title there was Critical Discourse Analyst. <laughs> 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 so quite understandably, again, it was not very easy for recruiters, for people interested in having a linguist in, 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 in the team, just to actually get something. Oh, critical discourse block? <laughs> what is this, right? So that's something I learned as well. And throughout the many interviews and many talks that we had, there were beautiful tips about how to interview. Okay, again, I'm going to talk about this later on as well, but... What happens when you are in academia and then you want to move from academia and try what's out there? It's not always the skills that you have, like this, the, the academic CV that you have that will be valid for that context, right? So that's some of the notes and some of the uh, reasons why for me, this three week period was life changing. And it is true that don't you fret, there are options out there. You can actually get to see the channel on YouTube. You can you can actually, if I'm not wrong, Alex, but you get the actual recordings from those days. You get them here, right? Yes. Um, you also have like the linguistics career cast where people, you know, Laurel Sutton reads um, interviews people to talk about their experiences. It's very interesting. For example, when I did this for Laurel, 
the conversation took us to a very personal place. So I was sharing how I became interested in language, like rooted in childhood. Like it's, it, it was an interesting conversation with her. So I would really encourage you to have a look at this and see, you know, different profiles that people actually share in a very intimate kind of context, because when you're in this interview podcast format, it's kind of like, okay, we just you know, openly talk about things, right? Okay. Um, so something that I also wanted to give you was this. Um, believe it or not, but when I started or I had the intention to start applying for industry positions, because of course I was interested, I was like, oh, what's out there? What can I do? Like, uh, uh, which are the different possibilities that I have? It's funny because I would personally send this academic CV, and this is a summarized version of it with eight pages. So you can have a look if you want. It's just uh, for you to give us a, like an interesting um, overview of things that I would send. Um, you like, it's not that I have a personal interest in you taking the, the uh, resumes with you or anything. It's just like illustrative, just for you to have a clear example, more paper-based thing. Um, and just to see like how to do it, right? But um, from that, this version, you can clearly tell, oh, very proud of my masters, like the book chapters, uh, so what, right? So from that, I had to make sure, and this was a beautiful exercise, to condense everything in two pages. And that is not something I knew, believe me or not. That's something I had to learn when I attended the LCL. So it was crucial to do that, especially to really understand what people in the industry are looking at, right? So after the three weeks, that's one of the things that I did. Okay, let me just change my resume. Let me just start kind of considering this more seriously. More changes that came alongside. Okay, LinkedIn title, remember? Remember what was the title? Critical Discourse Analyst. That was the first thing to go away. And I felt I was betraying my discipline and my academic self because I was like, a discourse analyst. I've been defined as a discourse analyst all my life, pretty much. It felt painful because, as, as we can talk about this later on, but, you know, this idea of, like, how academia is very much integrated in your personal being, in your physical persona, is a very interesting thing to explore. But that's the first thing that went away. So moving from the critical discourse analyst, understanding that that was not the stage of life that I was going to need that for, and really replacing the key terms and changing into something way more generic, linguist. <laughs> Researcher. And make it a bit more, um, I don't like the word marketable, but easier to understand for people who are in industry, because that's a reality. Like, if I tell someone I'm a discourse analyst, what's the percentage of population that would actually know what I know how to do? I mean, actually in Spain, um, when I would tell people I did an MA in Estudios del Discurso, people would think that it was like, oh, so maybe it's politician stuff. It's just writing speeches for politicians. So it was, it's an interesting approach that in a way it's not always um, nicely understood. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting exercise. This is a prototype, actually. I'm not sure if you have the chance to see it, but this was the original thing that I had created for that final template. It was like, okay, how do I want the resume to look? So uh, different sections. I'm, I'm, I apologize for people on Zoom, just not really getting. Um, but yeah, so it was like a prototype and kind of like, okay, let's see how I can do this. Now, the question of skills me turned out to be a real yes, I do have the skills. And actually, if you notice, um, it, when you do the critical exercise of just analyzing and understanding what's going on on your academic CV, 
you realize there are many skills that can be transferable to different settings. These are some examples. By the way, I just decided to give you a version of the um, these things the way I submitted to Amazon. That doesn't mean that today I would do it differently, but that's that was my best self back at the time. Okay, so project management, yes, I've done that. Like I, I've actually carried out, I've, I've dealt with people in academic setting. I did like had like a research group that in a way we had to find ways in how to operate, like budget, stuff like that. Um, of course, we do a lot of written and oral presentation. We do have autonomous problem solving. That's a reality. If some of you here on the PhD program, you know that you find ways to, to work independently, right? Because that's what you have to do. Of course, data science, for someone rooted in ancient Latin and ancient Greek like me, sounded like, oh gosh, this is not really me, data science. But as a matter of fact, we do, I did, as I tried to illustrate before, experiment design. That's something that I had to sit down with my advisors to see, oh, how do we go about this? I handled a lot of data, 1,200 interviews, sampling, visualization, and of course, linguistic error analysis. I spent eight years working for Cambridge ESOL examining candidates. Don't you think that you do have like a really prone tendency to find linguistic errors? Not necessarily people learning English, people multilingual learners, right? Of course, annotation. We all do annotation. Like if you have a corpus of language, if you, you're you interested in seeing the phenomena going out there, you tag little things. You provide labels to patterns. That's something we all do. You may think you don't, but you do. And this is something very interesting because even if it's just like grading students, finding patterns in, in, in written compositions, written by your learners. That is something that, in a way, it's it's linguistic error analysis, it's a lot of annotation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that was me when I was getting ready for industry. Also, as I said, I changed LinkedIn and what happened, and again, uh, if, I, if I brought all my notes, was just for a very simple reason. I always had the impression when I would listen to all these people in the um, career launch, that that happened out of magic. That happened out of intelligence that I didn't have. Like, I felt like, oh, of course, but these people, super intelligent. They're, they're just, they, 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 really, they, they really know how to do stuff. I'm not, it's, it's a very interesting thing. But in a way, it's, it's something that really, has to happen so it's just that doing that critical exercise and understanding what's going on and that is why i decided to bring all this mess of paper and more actually rudimentary materials that i'll be sharing in a minute with the only purpose of showing that there's real work behind this and this is real motivation of like trying to do things in a way that works for your personal life for your personal situation, professional thing at that time. So again, that's something that I would love you to take as something to take into account. You may be listening to me right now and thinking, oh, wow, I'm not there quite yet. Well, believe me, and I'll be sharing some of these things with you. You are, believe me or not, but you are. Now, so we do have the skills <laughs> we already. So let's get ready for industry. Okay. Magically, what happened was that after all these tweaks on LinkedIn, I got a call. Well, I got a message on LinkedIn from a recruiter. And I was like, oh, wow, this is very interesting because I actually, I was really interested in this position. I, of course, was aware of voice, AI, had the role of linguists there how we can actually improve those models, et cetera, et cetera. So I would spend a lot, a lot of time actually going through all the job offers and saying, oh, this is a job offer that I really find interesting. I even bought, and maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but that was the time I decided to buy an Alexa device. Before that, I didn't have it because I was like, okay, let's get ready for this. I know I can do this. So I got one and then I had a lot of interactions with Alexa and just trying to identify gaps there, et cetera, et cetera. But if I'm telling you this, it's just because 
Of course, it is a crucial. Oh, I'm, I'm not forgetting about the recruit side. It is a crucial. It's very important for you to, at a time where you're not certain of how to move forward, regardless of the context, regardless of the situation, a global pandemic, a divorce, whatever. It's always interesting just to have like, okay, what in, something that inspires me. And this, the italics there is actually intentional. Inspiration comes from many different places. It might be a professional inspiration. It might be a mental health inspiration. It might be a salary inspiration. It's actually rooted in multifaceted areas. So to me, as you can clearly tell, automatic speech recognition, natural language processing, text-to-speech. Those are three basic steps in voice AI that kind of, I'm sure if you have an interest in linguistics, that resonates with you. Am I right? Just from the outside, like not really knowing what's going on, but it's like natural language processing. Wow, this is something I could see myself doing. And of course, when all this is happening in the technological environment we're in, it's like, hey, hold on a minute. How is this, how does this magic happen? How do I tell this to this device? The device thinks about what's happening, process that, and give me an answer. Correct or incorrect, but I get an answer. So this was very interesting, and that's something that really fascinated me. So the recruiter reached out, and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> this is not possible. This might be scam. This is not true. This is not really happening, right? So we had like a phone call just to do like initial screening. Okay, this is what we have. This is what the, the, the offer might be, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is um, the real thing that I have. So what I did after identifying a role that might be an interesting fit for me, I just went for the description. Remember the skills that we showed before, that I showed before? So I was just trying to create this mis, you know, match, right? Like, okay, so where are the skills that I think I have? And let me just try to get some of the skills that I see in this job offer. So, well, just as you can see there, text annotation, grammar writing, data analysis, organizational skills. Aggressive deadlines. I'm very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> the day I actually finished these slides, Alex, I didn't want to tell you this, but I was like, oh my gosh. So I'm a very last minute person. And, and, and when I saw aggressive deadlines, I was like, okay, this is something that really works for me. Actually, not having deadlines doesn't really work for me. And we were talking about that before, right? Like, um, I, I do need deadlines to actually get my productive self to work. Okay, so... I said like, okay, this is an interesting position. I networked, I actually reached out to people who very patiently and kindly uh, agreed to have a um, informational interview, 10, 20 minutes, just, okay, uh, what do you do? I'm interested in this position. Do you think this is the right fit? Mind you, this is a very entry level position. And I know the AI, ML, machine learning thing sounds like, oh, I cannot do that. But believe me, just don't forget, ancient Greek and Latin, okay? Just, I, I come from there, like, <laughs> I come from from prototypes, piece of paper, uh, like, it's it's kind of like, I, I just want you to have that in mind, okay? So I said, okay, this seems like a thing. Let's get ready for it. So the first thing that I did was having this amazing book that I would highly recommend. I can start collecting these things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very interesting book. It's the it's referenced here. Uh, you can have a look if you want. I'm overwhelming you with a lot of things. But again, like it's it's um I think it's very useful to have like a real life sometimes real life thing in your hands. I'm not sure if you have the chance to 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 get to see the book, but if you actually open the book, you'll see how. I come from a background that might be very much resonating with you. That means taking notes, post it here, there. Hmm. So I really <laughs> took that introductory book, like introductory book, 
and really try to understand, okay, if this is an industry that I'm interested in, what is this all about? Enough knowledge to be able to put it in my interviews and just to show some knowledge and some degree of, um, of understanding of the field. Python, to me, was snake for many years. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, this is something else. This is way more than I thought. I was like, okay, and believe me, this was right after the um, career launch. I and I think we all felt so inspired by the many possibilities that I felt fearless. And I was one of those who would get a dark screen and really switch off, switch on. Let's see if this works. The fearless attitude that we ended up having really pushed me to say, okay, let's see what's What's Python? Like, what this is, as a matter of fact. What you discover is that, despite the very not user-friendly interface in many cases, it's just syntax. It's just creating things here and there. Okay, I define you as this, so I call this function, and then this fact. It's not something that should scare us as it does. So I took this courses for free on LinkedIn Learning. I'm sure you have access to that. If not here in public libraries, you do. So I was actually trying to get some um, insights into that. Now, I feel ready. I'm like, okay, I know what's going on. I just understand the architecture of this model. I can just kind of, I feel ready for this. All this was in parallel to the many long, you know, time, the, the, the very lengthy periods of time that Amazon would have between one interview and another one. I was also sharing this with someone before. The first thing that you get at Amazon is just something for you to check your general understanding of the business world, right? Like, oh, if a customer does this, then what do you do? I was like, okay, I'm out of here. Like, this is not, I'm not going to make it through. Stages, you know, like different phases, um, um, started to happen and then I was like okay this is getting serious so what can I do now a lot of uh, preparation I said okay I've identified this role let's see Amazon is just Amazon we get like okay I ordered this but Amazon is more than that you get many divisions you find out very easily and this is all public information by the way you find out very easily that you get leadership principles this idea like really really articulate Amazon's culture. So, okay, let's see this. And I'm not sure if you can read it, but invent and simplify innovation. And I wrote thesis topic. So I all the time try to connect these things with my own background, like, oh, maybe this is actually taking me here, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Also, something I learned at the LCL is that there was something called STAR method for interviewing. And that's something maybe you'll be learning a lot when you are taking this uh, magnificent um, module that you'll be having in the spring. Um, but it's just understanding that some companies use these models to actually articulate the interviews. So I will just give you with that, but I'll show you something that I would do. Okay, how do I, this looks like a, Endless. <laughs> How do I make this into something related to my own experience? So I would create things like that. In my role as a researcher, I have this situation, task, action, resolve. There are different options around this method, but this is pretty much something that would actually help you articulate your own stories. And I set that here always link it to your own experiences. And even if you've been working as, I don't know what, I'm sure there will be situation where you can actually relate to this. So with all this in mind, what you need to do is create a crazy little thing with a lot of posts. Like, okay, this is it. This is like, um, I don't know, like how many Spanish speakers you get in Mexico? I don't know, like I was gonna get that question. I didn't know. Um, which are the smart objectives? Which are the, um, what is a kickoff meeting? I didn't know what a kickoff meeting was. So it was 
you know, all this process of putting all these things together and making it into a cohesive, robust narrative. Okay. Hunter, 45, how are we doing? <laughs> Are you guys okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, I didn't know watching them was so humid. <laughs> okay, this is the last part. Are we okay? Yeah. Do we need a break? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to pass this around because then it's going to be taking a lot of time. But you can have a look afterwards if you're interested. Okay, year and a half, I got an offer, December 2021. I was like, oh my gosh, this is really happening. Like, I, I honestly, genuinely, trust me here, I thought I was not ready yet. I thought, okay, let me just try this out. Let me see how it feels. Um, um, it's very likely that I get rejected, but let me see how it goes. Um, surprise, Christmas, ah, job offer, great. Big issue, I had teaching to do back in Spain. And this is something that we can talk about this later. But as part of my postdoc, I had two years at Harvard, but I also had some teaching commitments that I could move around and put somewhere in between those four years finished. So I didn't mention this, not a nice trick there. Like, I was like, okay, I'm not going to get it. I'm just not going to get it. So let me get some practice and then see what happens. So I reached the final stage and I realized that I need to do my teaching commitments because believe me or not, for me, it was crucial to finish my postdoc time on good terms. So I reached a final point and I'm frank, open, really like, okay, I have this situation. I'm not ready to start quite yet. I would need time and I actually need, we are talking about, you know, this is December 2021. I told them I need until May 2022. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, it is not going to happen. Like, this is Amazon. They just need people fast. Come on. Okay, so back and forth negotiation. Okay, this, yes, but this, no, la 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 la. Fortunately, my start date was May. 2022. So I was like, okay, fair enough. That was phew. Okay. So from there till now, this is the final block. Learnings, initial challenges, that CDA role in industry, and something like, to me, I don't want you to see this as an exercise of arrogance, but more of a, okay, for someone with a very low professional self-esteem like i i kind of knew that i'm very good at teaching i love teaching it's my actual passion i've always wanted to be a teacher since i was five years old <laughs> but when it comes <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to an industry in ai machine learning i was not really a person to 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 feel comfortable about that so i want to share with you the annual review some parts of it of how people in my team and different teams got to see me after a year, just for you to see that those skills are not far from the skills you own and have. Okay, challenges, I get there. Cambridge, Pendle Square, massive building. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, let's see what's out there. Many initial challenges I can tell you. Uh, we were talking about this before. In English, you have this fantastic, I don't think it's fantastic, but this interesting term of leaving, I can see. And I don't know what you think about this, but you could actually use many terms. Remember, like a discourse analyst, it's always about, okay, the choice of words or the collocations that stay for some reason. For me, I find it really interesting how you're leaving academia, which seems to be sort of a place, like a, like a space where you feel cozy and nice, right? <laughs> so this was a great challenge, especially when you build your personal identity around your professional identity. I'm not sure if that's going to be the case for some of you in this room, but that was a clear case of that for me. I was Alfonso, and I was not Alfonso whatever thing you can think of. I was a teacher. 
And he comes naturally to me these days. If people, oh, what do you do? He comes out naturally. I don't say, I'm an AI ML data linguist. I normally say, I'm a, I'm a teacher. It comes naturally. It comes very much from, from within, right? So that was a process of really, really interesting times of actually understanding that, okay, maybe I'm pausing my time in academia, but it's it's not that I feel like I'm actually leaving. And I had many projects going on there that I wanted to pursue as well. Something that to me was very interesting was to talk about the biggest elephant in the room. And surprise, I was the biggest elephant oh. in the room for several reasons. I was the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> My manager was two years younger than me. And I has I had the highest academic degree in the room. Okay, how do you make that coincide uh, like harmonically go with getting to be new as a team? As you can imagine, many things that we actually nurture in academia, this ego thing like, oh my gosh, I've got a PhD, I know so much about everything. <laughs> it takes time to actually understand that there are fields you don't know anything about, and it's fine to ask, I don't know. So it was different and a very interesting process for me to really understand that, hey, yes, you may know a lot about linguistics, but you know nothing about many other things. So that was something interesting for me. I had a chaotic and boring experience, really chaotic. And, and this is somehow related to the biggest elephant in the room. Quite understandably, when you get into a team and you have a PhD in the Spanish Alexa team, some people may feel, okay, he's a native speaker of the language, he has a PhD. This person seems to be like a very strong competitor. So for some people, the way to act around that is just like, okay, you know what, I'm just going to ignore you <laughs> blatantly. <laughs> and that's something that you also need to know how to navigate because that's something that you find in some contexts. Also, it was actually too techy for me. Like I had to work in command prompt. I had to do some understanding, some Python scripts. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to cry. I don't want to do this. This is so difficult. The, the learning curve was so, so, so like massively big in front of me. So many challenges there. And also the completely different setting. The way communication happens, like, you know, when you get a, an email to your professor, so you get like, uh, uh, you're as a professor, you're sending an email to your students. Dear all, this is just to let you know that la, 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 what regards that is not something you do in industry at all. And you may think this is a very straightforward thing to think, but when you've been embedded in a system that works in specific ways, then it's actually very challenging to change those practices. I'm gonna give you one specific example. Once I was talking to my manager and I said, oh, this is very characteristic of this grant. Character <laughs> what? It's like, okay, can you can you explain what you mean by characteristic? And well, maybe for me that was very straightforward, but for some people it's not. And it's the interesting part of just adapting to, okay, this is not a soliloquy. It's just, okay, I need to communicate. And it was dealing with um, uncertainty. Um, this was not the best time for tech. I landed this in December 2021 at a specific time in the tech industry. November 2021, we had this huge, massive layoff. Um, and I don't know how I survived to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, coming from a world of tranquility, the coziness of academia into something that, okay, people can kick you out. So you're out. I actually took my belongings from that, from my desk that day, hoping that I was going to be fired to find out later on that I was not. I was like, oh, nice. But I honestly felt that I was gonna be, I was, I was gonna get fired that day. Final thoughts. Stay open to possibilities. I think life is very fluid these days, really. Honestly, who in this room was expecting to get into a global pandemic? People in Europe, we really didn't think of a war 
very close to us and it's actually happening it's 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 something that to me it's crucial and this is the best learning that i take from this do not underestimate your own skills you have and you have many and i'm sure they will show when people have to evaluate your assessment also really strive to be flexible and versatile and i hope that's something that comes across coming from my research background i always tried Yes, this is a social approach, but I was interested in digital discourse, dealing with data online, trying to, you know, open up as many doors as you can because you don't know how they may come handy. And remember, we're learning experts. We actually do how to learn things. And that's why you're an MA program at Georgetown. So again, when you feel yourself like, okay, this is maybe not that I'm ready for, when you doubt yourself, because that's something that is very likely to happen whenever you transition into any professional setting, just think of this as a way like what people are looking at is just not necessarily if you know how to program. In some roles, they will, but in many others, they won't. So they will be looking at how strong you communicate or how strongly you communicate, how able you are to share the knowledge that you have. So again, that is something that if I were to uh, finalize with, that would be it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Bravo. Thank you so much. We are ready for any questions in the room for just a couple of minutes. And then I want to invite you to join us in the lounge area for wine, cheese, and crackers. And I'll keep the questions open on Zoom. Hi, Alfonso. Um, I really thoroughly enjoyed your whole presentation. It was very captivating. I did not get lost anywhere. Okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> um, uh, I have two questions. First is I'm very curious about your questionnaire design when you were talking about your um, undocumented um, immigrant survey, um, particularly the slide where you were showing the uh, like the different factors that you were asking people to um, kind of rate uh, which metaphorical words uh, that they were choosing. I was wondering um, how you designed that question, um, as in um, whether, like the, the I think it was the previous slide or something, like with that actual question, or maybe the next slide. Like it was it was the actual question with like flooding into. Oh. Um, yeah, so were they asked to choose like whether they felt strongly with um, any of these words? Did, were they provided with other options as well, or were they forced to like choose it? That's an excellent, um, a very interesting question. Um, that's the main reason why, for the same prompt, we decided to incorporate the blank option way before. Um, again, design experiment, right? If this question would have come first, you kind of prone people to okay, um, undocumented immigrants are flooded into the US. So this was first, and actually that's an also interesting observation. People didn't get to see the question after. So they were prompted with this. They actually had to complete information there. Interestingly, and as my professor mentioned, some people would just include like a coma and move on, right? But they couldn't actually move on without like entering any text here. So yeah, it was open. Um, um, there was actually no character limitation. People wrote disturbing but interesting stuff. <laughs> um, and interestingly, that was what actually opened up the possibilities for qualitative observation. Whereas for this one, it was more like, okay, I'm interested in each of these domains. I'm curious to see if, again, the main hypothesis was like, well, I'm sure Republicans versus Democrats will actually show something interesting here. That was not the case, but it was the case for different variables. So yeah, that was how that was uh, decided. This was part of a huge um, survey. Like uh, it was a class project with people talking about, I don't know, different um, um, different situations within undocumented immigrants in the US. So yeah, that was part of the survey. Did you observe most of the uh, negative uh, responses in the open-ended um, question, or were there also positive ones? There were positive ones. Um, to me, it was very interesting to see how 
they were very embedded in many cases in conditional sentences, which to me was a bit, okay, come on. Are human beings, but we are all human beings, regardless of how much we, you know, go up around in the world, right? So to me, um, that was interesting to say, um, but it was mostly negative. It was it was an um, interesting, negatively loaded, in very creative ways, though. Like, that was interesting to say. I'd like to read out one question from Zoom, because I hope that all of you can stay for the cheese. And this is from Maddie, who asks, I heard Alfonso say he had no coding background. If so, my question is, when you interviewed for the job at Amazon Alexa or at other tech companies, did they ask the infamous question, what technical skills do you have? Or do you have experience coding? And if so, how did you respond? Because we have technical skills as linguists. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, and I thank you for that. Um, we actually had a technical section in the interview, so we had to go through um, very interesting problems. And okay, for example, how would you categorize this, and how would you label this, and how would you create syntax in a way that this makes sense to create, or just to, to build this script? Um, that was part of it. What I know for sure, and I know that holds true for similar positions at different companies, depending on the nature of the role, it's not like the final yes, like, oh, this person has the technical skills. Um, I agree with the comment. It's something that can be learned, especially if you're pushed to learn it. Um, I think something key here is that we're a bit reluctant to actually get into those, you know, contexts of coding and just like seeing what's out there. But yeah, in my case, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very specific with the answer, I was asked that, especially because the natural progression for people in my role will be language engineer, which is something which is suspected to have a stronger um, technical component, at least when NLU, NLP was at stake. With large language models now, ugh. I don't know. I, I, it's of course needed, but I think the role of linguists with all Gen AI, it's going to rather change in the in the approach that we will be taking there. So yeah, we got that. I mean, we we have that, and that's something that it's likely for a tech company. It's like it's likely that that will come up at some point. Well, thank you for Sure, go ahead, Diana. And I think this might be the last one for the room, and then we will break and go for some wine and cheese. <laughs> um, sure. And I thank you for that. Just one thing. Um, I really apologize for having taken a bit longer than expected. I always counted on having like a little bit of time outside when you just come and ask questions. So please feel free to do so afterwards. I, I have no rush. So yeah. Sorry. Um, I'll try to make it quick then. Um, based on your experience as kind of from the inside of a tech company now, um, do you think there's anything that linguistics or linguists who are going that path are likely to have under their radar that maybe we should have on our radar as the next big thing? Or is there anything that we might be focusing on at the expense of skills that are going to be more valuable mm. in industry? Thank you. Um... Something that I've actually really enjoyed as part of this process was when we had to work on ethical and responsible AI. Um, I have the impression that is something that we get exposed to in the news, like this big tech people meeting the US, um, you know, president, part um, the White House, <laughs> just people talking about this debate and how crucial that will be. I don't have the impression that we see many roles related to responsible AI, AI as of now. My personal gut feeling is that if AI keeps evolving the way it is at the moment, there will be a huge need to actually stop and think, okay, how are we using this technology? Something very basic, very ethical, very philosophical. Okay. Where is this leading? Where is this taking us? And those are questions that, as you very well know, are actually rooted in the humanities. So um, 
my impression, and this is just coming out of my own personal perception, I that's something I'm really interested in professionally. And if you do like a LinkedIn search and we just go like responsible AI, not many positions come up. And I have the impression that that is a uh, a sector that will be glued up, that will be actually blooming in the near future. Um, something that it's actually always okay to have, uh, especially when you're doing your graduate programs. Coding is not necessarily something that it's out of reach for us. And if you can actually use that to implement that in your academic life, that is always welcome. And I think that's always something that will make your life easier. My personal recommendation, again, don't feel paralyzed by the fact that we're not people who are trained in coding, in scripting, in all these things. Because it just takes a little bit of a push, like being put on the spot, like, okay, what is this about? So um, that is something to, of course, have if, if you are considering tech in the future. But again, and that's related to the first part of the question, responsible AI, in my view, it's likely to be a very crucial thing in the short, medium term. Wonderful. Well, at this point, let's give him a warm thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And for all of you, I appreciate you staying for this for this period. And please, I invite you to come to the other end of the department and have a quick snack with us. And we can talk more with Alfonso. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. <laughs>